My name is Melissa Medina, and I'm part of the leadership team of Emerge Americas. If you haven't heard of it before, it's a global technology conference that we launched right here in Miami in 2014, basically to propel and foster the tech ecosystem here in Miami, to create a launch pad of innovation, and more than anything, to do something that no other conference has done before, and that is to connect Latin America, North America, and Europe right here in Miami. I also happen to be a Miami native, born and raised in Miami Beach, not too far from here, and now raising my family here as well. I can tell you firsthand that the transformation that Miami has seen in the last three to five years in terms of tech and entrepreneurship is extremely incredible and it's palpable. So what has happened in Miami in the last few years to make it such a global city, multicultural, diverse, bringing a blend of all these innovative ideas? First and foremost has definitely been um, the leadership of Matt Hagman, who I believe is here today as well. Oh, hey, hey Matt. Um, through the Knight Foundation, pouring millions of dollars into local initiatives in terms of tech and entrepreneurship, uh, Endeavor, opening its first ever U.S. office here in Miami. This is a company that was established in 1997 in countries all over the world, and they decided to choose Miami. We have amazing startup activity here. Uh, the Kaufman Report has recently reported that we are number two in the country in terms of startup activity. We have incubators and accelerators that have set up shop in Miami. We have venture capital funds that are setting up shop in Miami. And of course, Companies such as Twitter, Facebook, and Uber setting up shop in Miami. We have incredible success stories that have come out of the city in the last few years. I can tell you firsthand, Emerge Americas is one of those. It was a crazy, or people would call it a crazy concept that my father came up with in 2012. And now this vision has turned into over 6,000 people attending in 2014, over 10,000 people from 50 different countries in 2015, and now 2016 promising to be even bigger and better. Of course, all the incredible work that Miami Day College has been doing right here, they have been creating an amazing local um, talent pool pipeline for us here in our community with opening Magic, one of the first animation and gaming center of its kind here in Florida. The Idea Center, where we are today, which recently celebrated its first year. It's dedicated to nourishing the spirit of entrepreneurship through experiential learning and groundbreaking education. It's a true hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. And of course, how could Miami be considered innovative without Uber having entered our market? Uber entered here in 2014, and I want to apologize, Travis, for any type of pushback you had from our community, because I can tell you that I, along with my family, Everybody here, thousands of supporters, have supported Uber from day one. I don't even remember what it is not to have Uber. I Uber here today, as a matter of fact. <laughs> and Uber has truly made Miami a much more connected place. It has enabled safe rides for people from all parts of Miami-Dade County. And it has given people of Miami another income-earning opportunity. It is an incredible company. It's locally, it has a locally based office now who I've had the pleasure to work with. They have a great team. And in shortly, I'm going to present to you, introduce to you, Travis Kalanick, Uber CEO and co-founder, and the person behind the success of Uber. Travis loves to meet young entrepreneurs such as yourself to tell about his story, which is pretty fantastic, including founding a company out of his UCLA dorm room, to launching Uber just five years ago in San Francisco. It feels like Uber has been around forever. Um, it's only been five years, and thank God that he did do that five years ago. Travis is gonna be sharing with you what he has learned to be the eight great traits of being a great entrepreneur. I'm really excited to hear this, part, this presentation. After the presentation, we're gonna have some question and answer session for about 20, 25 minutes with Travis. Questions that you all Gave us. So thank you to all those that submitted questions. Let's please give a very warm Miami welcome to Travis Kelly. Um, I will speak <laughs> 
he like packed them in. <laughs> um, well, first, before I get started, who here, uh, who here would consider themselves an entrepreneur? All right, we got, we got some, some people in the house. By the time we're done here, everybody's raising their hand. All right, now normally I like to walk around. I'm not sure I can walk around. Uh, does it work? Can you hear me? Is it it's, yep. Yep. good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, this is better for me. Okay, so uh, the speech that we're going to be doing today, or the, the presentation I'm going to do today, is um, what I call the eight great traits of entrepreneurs, or really, I'm sorry, the eight traits of great entrepreneurs. And uh, in many ways, these are just, there's no entrepreneur that is all of these all of the time. Uh, they're aspirational. But it's a starting point to say, hey, look, you know, how can I think about things in a way that is going to make me better at what I do? Um, and even for myself, right? Uh, there's nobody's perfect, and so we're always trying to sort of set the bar really high and and, and continue to, to meet and then meet expectations, but then reset them. All right, so first one, when it comes to being a great entrepreneur, is about purpose, right? Is a lot of people want to start a business, want to build something, want to create something, but a lot of times people create something that doesn't, that they don't actually connect with. And actually, even before you become an entrepreneur, I think when you get out of school and go into the world and you're, you're creating a career, a lot of people don't know, well, what should I be working on? What should I be doing? I mean, guys, we only live once. And even before you go into the entrepreneur world, it's important to say, well, who am I? What are the things I love to do? What are the things I'm good at? And what are the things in the world that best resonate with that? And as an entrepreneur, that's even more important because you can't create something from nothing. You can't create something that didn't exist before and go through all of the tough times that will happen by doing it without truly believing in what it is you're doing. Um, so purpose is number one, and it's for, it's for a reason. So in Uber's case, we have our own mission statement. We like to say transportation is reliable as running water everywhere for everyone. It took us a while to get in Miami. <laughs> but it's on that path of everywhere. And once we're in Miami, right, how we were rolling when we first got here is different than today. We are bigger today, and when we are bigger, we have more consumers that are using the app, but that also means more drivers that are serving their city. It also means no matter where you go, you're able to get a ride back. And so everywhere is a big thing, but everyone is also big and really important. Everyone means that, uh, the, the everyone part of this means that um, everybody can use it. And ultimately, we like Uber to be cheaper than owning a car. The only way you can do that is by bringing efficiency. And there's, of course, a lot of great things that happen to a city when we make this a reality in a city. So we like to say that we're building, or we are a part of building and helping cities become, well, the cities of the future. Right? There's a nice little animation of, wow, that's Miami in, I don't know, 2050 or something, but that's pretty cool. Um, let's have a vision for what cities could be. But see, there's the other side of that, there's what... What are the cities today, right? If cities today are, well, you have, let's just start with, let's say you have 30 people. Those 30 people going to work are in 30 different cars. What if you have a situation where one car was serving 30 people? You could take a huge number of cars off the road, and by doing so, well, of course, you don't have the parking problems that you have today. Uh, by doing so, you don't have the congestion and traffic problems, you don't have the pollution. You don't have the drunk driving. Like, there's a lot of great things that happen, so why don't we turn this into something that looks more like that? Now, this is a little bit of uh, tongue-in-cheek because, well, we still have to have some cars on the road, <laughs> but, the, but the road should feel like this. And so, oops, sorry. So the way in which we get there is through efficiency. And there's a lot of things we do with efficiency. Um, in uh, what we're doing to make, you know, it's, it's sort of, Uber's this magical experience. You, you just get out an app, you push a button, and a, and a car shows up. And five years ago, that was some magic comic book kind of thing, right? But today, that's real. But 
but how did the car know you were going to be there? How did this all just happen, and, and why is it efficient? Well, we're predicting demand ahead of time, and then doing the best we can to tell drivers where that demand is going to be before it happens. So we like to say, well, we have a heat map of demand, which is a prediction of where the requests are going to be in the next 15 minutes. But we present with that heat map, though, we know where the cars are in real time in the city. Those cars are anti-heat. They suck heat out of the map. And so what's left is a residual, what we call residual heat, or essentially a supply positioning map. So they can go to where the demand is going to be and where they're most likely to make a fare in the next 15 minutes. That makes the whole thing more efficient. By allowing the drivers to have the car full as many minutes as possible during the hour, the price can go down, right? The driver's income can be steady or growing while the price goes down if you get more and more efficient. Now, one of the ways in which we get more efficient is um, a product we, we call Ubercool, and it's coming to Miami soon. Um, and what it means is you push a button, car comes, you get in the car, but it just so happens when you, when you open the door, you look in, there's somebody else already in the car. What happens is you have two people taking the same trip at the same time, or a similar trip at the same time. And now you have two cars that would have been taking two people, is now one car taking two people. The price comes down, the driver can make more money, and then the thing gets more efficient, and then all those great things we talked about that can happen with that efficiency, the city gets better. Right? So, of course, those cars, uh, those cars are driven by our partners. Right? We call them our driver partners. And um, there's a big thing that happens when millions of people in the city use this kind of service. Well, those millions of people need to get around their city with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of drivers. And so folks who are underemployed, unemployed, have a new opportunity to make a living, to make income, to feed their families, but also folks who just want to serve their city and love their city and love meeting people every day and interacting with their community, this is kind of, this is the, this is sort of like a, an entrepreneurial way for them to make a living. Um, the second, the, uh, the second um, uh, trait is, well, what I call magic, or we could say, where's the magic? It's something you should ask yourself when you're making something, because if there's no magic in what you're doing, why is somebody, a customer, going to use your service or your product compared to everything else that exists. You have to do something special. It has to be unique. It has to stand out. And if it does, then you have a chance at succeeding. So you believe in what you're doing. You believe you're going to make a difference. But then for the consumer, it has to feel magic. So you have to ask yourself, where is the magic? And uh, some of you may have seen this movie, or it's an old school movie called Pulp Fiction. Yeah. I'm dating myself just a little bit, but there's this briefcase. And it's, you never see what's in the briefcase. But every time Samuel Jackson opens that, everybody just sort of stands and they just look at it. Like, they're, they're in awe of what is inside. Well, that's how you should feel. You should feel like Samuel L. Jackson when you are showing people the thing that you've created. And hopefully, and it doesn't always happen this way, hopefully the people you're showing it to are like awestruck when they see it. And maybe they are a little bit, maybe they're not at all, but you should be really shooting for taking it all the way. And every day you should be making it more magical so it feels that way. So at Uber, we thought about, okay, what, we, we really thought about what it means to make magic. Because we've gone from a company of five people sitting around a table to a company of 5,000 people. And it's no longer just us sitting around talking about things. It's like the things we talk about have to be something that, that you know, there needs to be a 1,000 tables of five people, and they need to know what, what is Uber Magic. And so what we've broken it down into a few things. We've broken down magic into four dimensions. The first dimension is time. So, if, by the way, if you do these four things in your product, I don't even care what it is. I don't care if it's related to Uber. I don't care if it's product you're selling, I don't care if it's service, I don't care. If you do these four things, I promise you, whatever you're making will be magic. So the first dimension is time. That's a little bit of an Uber perspective, but we like to say, if you can give people their time back, 
that is the start of something magical. The second, whoops, the second is calm. If whatever it is you're selling or providing to your customers brings them calm, that's the second piece of magic. Third is joy. Right? If you can deliver joy to your customers, well, you're getting even further along this magic train. And fourth is money. Right? Is that if you can build something that allows them to do all those other things, but do it cheaper, or make more money on the driver's side, they're able to make more income, but the kind of job that a driver has is very interesting. Because before, maybe they were working at, let's say, a Target, or they were working, they were, you know, some sort of retail job, let's say. They have to punch in the, on the time clock. Every move they make is watched. If they want to go to the bathroom, they have to ask, they have to ask for permission. Uh, if they're late to work, they get scolded. Like, they are working for the man. But if you go on the Uber, what happens is you light up an app, you push a button, and that's when you start working. And oh, you got to pick up your daughter from school? You just turn the work off. Uh, oh, wait, you've got a few extra hours on the weekend? You just turn your work on. And that, too, is a way of creating magic, something that's very different than what, than the other ways of making a living, a very flexible way of, of making a living. And so you do that, and then also you make more money while you're doing it, and that's when things can get interesting. So we've seen in the world things that I think we would consider magical. This is a uh, this is a schematic for the patent that was basically describing the iPhone. I can't remember the year. I think it's like 2002 or something crazy six. like that. Is that when the patent was? Okay, so it was it was okay. Thank you very much. I should know that date. Um, but this this basically we're like nine years later, guys. And it looks like what we have today, right? Like, I don't know, this thing looks pretty much the same, right? So part of, there's two ways to get at this. One is the big breakthrough idea that changes the ballgame. I'd say the iPhone is in that category. But then there's the other way of getting the magic, which is refining something a little bit every day over time in the pursuit of perfection. And you refine it to a point where it becomes exquisite, it becomes refined, it becomes simple, um, and it becomes a, a beautiful experience to use. Now, it just so happens the iPhone is both. I mean, you guys are familiar with Airbnb, right? Yeah. Now I can go and get an amazing villa in Miami or basically almost anywhere else in the world with a push of a button, right? Instead of going to sort of a drab hotel or just this sort of traditional way of of going and traveling, it's this new way to travel that feels much more connected to your city. Um, and that's a beautiful experience, it's a different experience. Uh, it's a magical experience. But at the end of the day, magic is something that you just know in your heart. Right? When you look at the Golden Gate Bridge, you're like, that's a beautiful thing. And when you travel over it, you see people taking pictures. You want to take a picture yourself. If you're in an Uber, you can do that. <laughs> now, on the other side of the Bay Area, we have the Bay Bridge. Okay? You just know the difference when you see it. You know magic when you see it. So the third one is, what's hard about it? The question that you should ask is, well, if, if, if you have passion for it, and it is magical, but once you put it out in the world, everybody can do it? Well, that's going to be a little bit tricky because, well, the magic will be gone. And so, for instance, this is a, a machine. This is a, a vehicle we have out of Pittsburgh, it's a, you know, from our research facility, where we're out there mapping the world. This is how the car looks at streets. We're getting three-dimensional maps of the world. It's important for making sure that you can navigate vehicles through cities. But of course, I also talked about matching demand and supply. This is New York City. It's a heat map of demand that I described before. Again, matching, so predicting demand ahead of time in time and space. And then tr let's say, let's say this, was, this was a city, and the demand sort of looked like this in three dimensions over that city over the next 15 minutes. Well, you want supply to match to it. Now, how do you make that happen? Actually, it's very difficult. 
The mathematics are incredibly difficult. And making it so that you squeeze every minute of downtime out is very difficult. I don't even know what this is. It looks, it looks amazing. <laughs> uh, now, if, you know, remember, Uber is, you know, when we're everywhere, we mean it, right? We're in, we're all over the world. We're in Medellin, Colombia. We're in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. We're in 20 plus cities in China. Now, in China, they have a phone that's like, I don't know, like a third of the price or something crazy like this. It's an extreme discount off of an iPhone. It has almost all the features. Now look, it's a lower end phone, but they've done something magical with bringing some of the great, bringing some of the magic that you would get with an iPhone, but bringing it to the masses. Um, and uh, this is Xiaomi right here. Okay, perception versus reality. So the great entrepreneur knows the difference between the two, and in fact, looks for lots of situations uh, where that difference is very big. I like to say, hold on, so I'm going to take a sip of the water. Perception is conventional wisdom. It's how the world thinks something works, or the way, it's the way, it, it's way the world thinks about something. And then there's reality. Now, sometimes reality and perception are the same, but sometimes reality is way over here, and perception is way over here. So, some people might think that Donald Trump's going to be a great president. I would say that's perception. Okay. And there's a reality that may or may not be the same. But what I'd like to say is that when you fuck the entrepreneur, when you see a difference, when you see everybody going this way, you're like, you know what, that's not quite right. They think of something a certain way, but the reality is over here. The bigger the distance, well, that distance between the two, I call the innovator's playground. Explain why. Well, look, you know, a lot of times it's going to be hard. You have to know, by the way, when you, when, you know, if you think that it's, you know, for instance, let's say you think tomorrow, here's a really simple example. Let's say you think tomorrow's going to be a sunny day, but the, the weatherman says it's going to be raining. Well, if, it, if you're right, you can plan your day tomorrow, and if everybody thinks it's going to be rainy, all the activities you're going to do are probably going to be cheaper, there are going to be less tourists around, you're going to have a better day if you're right. If you're wrong and perception and reality did line up, well, you're, you're going to be going out to the beach and it's going to be raining. Right? And so that's a very simplistic version of this, but you can see it in everything. And so when you decide to go against, to, to, when you decide that perception and reality are different, you have to know that you're going to go against the grain. I mean, if you build a company and all you're doing is going where conventional wisdom goes, then you're going to be doing what everybody else is already doing. And if you're doing what everybody else is already doing, what you're doing is not going to be fundamentally different. When you bring something new to the world, it's because nobody thought of it or nobody could do it. But you figured out a way to do it. You went against the grain. And so you have to be resilient. You have to be tough. And you have to be ready to hear lots of no's before it actually starts working. In my last company, the first four years, I didn't make a salary. One of those years, I was work, uh, living at my parents' house, right? And I, I like to say I was getting 100 no's a day for four years straight. That's like over 100,000 no's. And so you have to be ready for you have to be ready for that, and you have to be resilient. You have to be willing to go against the grain. And so, a quote from Albert Einstein: "The one who follows the crowd will usually go no further than the crowd." The one who walks alone is likely to find themselves in places no one has ever been. And that's a really great way of putting it. I'd like to take credit for that quote, but I can't. <laughs> and so here's a, a funny image I got off the internet, right? So a lot of people might say, well, they're looking at the mirror and they say, well, that's a lion. I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> but, but from this perspective, actually, the reality is it's a kid, right? So you might have a new friend. And so the difference between the two matters. You just better be right. Because if you think it's a kitten and it's a lion, you've got problems. <laughs> and another part of perception versus reality and understanding it is also understanding how you look at risk. Entrepreneurs have to be better assessors of risk. 
They have to see something where people see a lot of risk and they see none, they go after it. Where people see no risk, but you see a lot, and you're right, you have to be right, you stay away from it. But sometimes there's just things that are risky. Whoops, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, our Wi-Fi is risky. <laughs> <laughs> so we saw the picture of the guy walking, I think it was the it was the Niagara Falls, right? That's just risky. That's not something I'm going to do, and I'm pretty sure there's nobody in that room that's going to do it. By the way, that's conventional wisdom. Somebody here is going, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to show you. That's the entrepreneur mindset in some ways, is to prove, prove people wrong. But most of us are not going to be doing that, because it is risky, because very likely we die. Now, we can both see the same risk, but if for some reason somebody has a special ability to mitigate that risk, to take the risk out of it, and then walk across Niagara Falls, no big deal, then again, you can do something special that nobody else can do. So, sometimes it's seeing the difference between perception and reality, other times it's seeing reality for what it is, but being much better, much more capable, much more expert at navigating that risk. So where people say, I'm gonna die, if you're a really good tightrope walker, you're like, oh, no big deal. And then you can do something nobody else can. Then there's this concept, what I call the analytical and creative cross. So um, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, my dad was an engineer. Um, but my mom, she's a salesperson. She was a salesperson at the Los Angeles Times. She's very creative, more of a right brain kind of uh, woman. And well, I'm kind of the product of the two. It means that, man, I have the math side of my brain. That's usually the first place I go. But I've also created. So I have analytical, analytical sort of uh, instincts, but a creative flair on top of it. And that matters because, well, you can create, this is actually the world's first computing machine. You can create the machine. But what's it going to do? How are you going to inspire people with it? What's it going to do to change our lives? And how do you connect with the human aspect? That's very much a creative process. And so at Uber, we do things like, well, you know, just push a button, get a ride. Once a year, we have Uber ice cream day. And you can push a button, and an ice cream truck brings you ice cream. <laughs> and that's just magical. That's from the creative side. And so I had that idea one day, and I'm like, we got to do this. And what ends up happening is people go nuts. Right? When you push a button and an ice cream truck going do 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 it's like coming down and coming to you. When you were eight years old, you were chasing the ice cream truck, now it's chasing me. People become eight-year-olds all over. And you're tapping into something that you can't describe with now. It's just that creative flair that, that inspires you. Of course, well, you can have all these ideas, you can you can build great things, but you still have to go to market. And sometimes people believe if I build it, they will come, and that is the dying words of a failed entrepreneur. Because you can't just build it and they will come, you have to go to market. And sometimes it's like, you know, if you talk in the you know in Silicon Valley, they talk about viral networks and growth hacking and things like that. There's actually a lot of analytical things you have to do. So that when somebody gets that email, are they going to click on the link like, I want to buy this, right? When somebody gets a sign-up form because there's some service they're signing up for, how do you get them through that sign-up form as efficiently as possible? What if, what if the way you grow, and this is actually the way Uber's grown, is actually once you ride, then you can tell your friend. And if you tell your friend about Uber and they take a ride, your next ride is free. Well, I could get free rides for life. I'm cool with that. And so a third of how Uber has grown is just through that method. Right? And so it cycles through, and that's how we grow. And there's a science to that. But there's also these things that we do. This is Uber Chopper. Right? I think this is probably in China. And again, capturing people's imagination while having these sort of growth hacking kind of approaches so that things can go viral, you do those two things at the same time, that's when things get big. Then there's a, what I call enjoying the ride. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, when you get an Uber, you definitely should enjoy the ride. But, 
but as an entrepreneur, you need to enjoy what you're doing, and that's also why purpose matters. I didn't go through four years, I didn't go through four years of not making a salary hating what I was doing. That was my last company, right? Eventually, after seven years, we got acquired, but like, it was a long, tough road, and almost every entrepreneur, almost every entrepreneurial road is. Even a situation like Uber, the only way you win is by pushing to the point where it hurts. And so you have to, oh, there we go. <laughs> you have to enjoy the ride. You know, it starts with a purpose and goes through all the other things I said, but, but you have to enjoy what you're doing every day, and that's why the thing that you do should resonate with who you are. Because most likely it's not gonna just work right from the start. Most likely it's not gonna work. Most likely you're gonna get those 100 no's a day for a year straight, or several years straight. But if you enjoy building, if you enjoy creating, if you enjoy having that briefcase and opening the box and showing something that's magical that somebody's never seen before, then every day can be wonderful. Every day can be fun and interesting. And even the hardest problems are fun to solve. So a lot of times I, I like to sort of think of myself as like a math professor um, you know, a math professor without a math problem. That's a really sad math professor, right? Math professor who's happy is the one that's getting the hardest problems and solving them. He's got problems. He or, she, he or she's got problems, and if you don't have any problems if, when you're entrepreneuring, then you're not solving anything. If you're not solving anything, you're not really an entrepreneur. And so we often like to look to role models within Uber about people that we see in the world, and a lot of times sports is a great place to do it, who are the champions out there? Who are the, who are the, the champions don't become champions just because they have a special athletic talent. To get to the absolute best, you actually have to love it. Uh, Serena Williams is like a perfect example of that. And so that sort of leads me to champions mindset. Uh, champions mindset at Uber, you know, well, with the champions mindset, you are much more likely to win. In fact, I believe with the champions mindset, it's almost impossible to lose. And I'll describe what I mean by champions mindset. One, you put everything you got on the field. Every ounce of energy, every ounce of passion you got, you put into winning and to succeed. Um, but the second part is, you're going to get knocked down along the way, and when you do, you get back up. And if you keep getting back up no matter what, it's almost impossible to lose. If you're putting everything you've got in, and you keep getting back up, it's almost impossible to lose. Now, you've got to use all the other principles, guys. You can't just use this one. Um, but if you're constantly looking for what reality is and the difference between reality and perception, you're constantly looking for that new thing that's going to inspire people, and you keep getting these no's, and you keep perfecting it, you keep refining it, you keep trying to make it more magical. And when you get knocked down, you keep coming back up, and you keep every day putting everything you got into it, you will eventually succeed. And so we have, I, there's a video I like to show at Uber about what the champion's mindset means to me. I think we can just, we can start that from the beginning. Get to the video right now. <coughs> Hold on a second, guys. If there's audio, that'd be wonderful. Overall. That's Bob Dorn moving into the lead. Sophomore, Ben Stewart. 
And you know, that idea of being able to push a button and getting a ride wherever you are. Yeah, exactly. For Miami, yeah. that is magic. Absolutely. So I think it becomes the, the one really interesting part about Uber is that it becomes more magical over time. The reason why is as there are more customers, I've saying this before, as there are more customers, there are more drivers. And with more drivers, you get better coverage in the city. And then as it gets better coverage, the pickup times go down. And uh, your ability to go anywhere in the city and know that you're going to get a ride back, like, goes up. And so it's one of these situations where Uber actually gets better over time just because of the nature of how it works. And so the magic which we know Uber to be today is the most magical it's ever been. Um, and it's just been getting a little bit more magical every day. I remember trying Uber for the first time in San Francisco a few years back and definitely thinking this is pure marketing. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so now something a lot of people don't know is that when we first started, we didn't start this as like a big business. That was not it's not our purpose. Right. At the beginning, this was a side project. It was for me, my co-founder, and our hundred. And in fact, you could get the app in the app store, but you had to get a special code from me to use the app in the app store. And you know, friends from like elementary school were starting to like reach out to me and go, remember me, <laughs> the sandbox, we're making the <laughs> And that's when we just opened it up, yeah. right? Okay. And, and so, so, I guess, oh, sorry to interrupt. No, no. Is that sometimes you don't know where the journey's going to go, and that's the part where I talk about, you know, is, is, is going, enjoying the ride. Because you don't know where the thing, where something's going to end up, but you just have to love what you're doing. Sure, the journey can sort of transform and morph along the way. For sure. Yeah. So, question from the audience. Were you scared of failure when starting up your own company? Yeah. Um, I think it was one of the tougher things I had to get over as an entrepreneur. Uh, so, in the early days, in my first company I wasn't, it was because it was just, uh, my first company was an SAT prep company. And uh, I sort of started by tutoring people. And um, uh, that became, it then became a school, and that grew, but uh, it was more sort of incremental and sort of, uh, it was a small business that, um, that just sort of grew a little bit over time, and so I didn't have that fear of failure. Mm -hmm. But in my last company, I most definitely did, and that's when I, I wasn't just tutoring people and growing over time, I had an idea that was very different than everything else that existed. And every time I try to sell it, they would say no. Right? These are the hundred no's a day for four years straight. And the the problem with that is like, well, you get investors. Uh, it just so happened that Mark Cuban was one of my early investors, and he was on the board. And, and you sort of feel like if this doesn't work, I'm kind of out of the game. Like, and also I was scared because I don't know how well I would work for somebody else. You know, if I'm an employee, I think that could go badly. <laughs> so, uh, so you get attached to being successful. You get attached to the image of being successful. And you get pretty scared of failure. And what happens when you start having a fear of failure is you stop being, it can hurt your creativity. And it can hurt your ability to, cre to create new things fast. And so you find yourself doing even longer hours of being more stressed. Um, and that stress makes it harder to create, and then you get this cycle. Um, and so you have to work your way out of it. And I had a real tough time because of those four years without a salary and running out of money three or four times my last one before it finally succeeded. Um, you know, I had this, this entrepreneur I talking to, and one of the things I used to say was money, money can, money does not not get you happiness, not my happiness, but it will pay for therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, you know, we all have to do our own sort of therapy on ourselves when we have that fear of failure because it's going to keep you from being successful. Um, but once you get over it, then you can start to enjoy the ride. But, but if you have that, it's too dominant in you. Uh, yeah, it, it can be tough. Okay, another audience question. Can you talk about your expansion and growth strategies? Specifically, how do you open new markets and cities at such a high pace? This person sounds like a competitor. 
Thank you so much for taking the time.